welcome back everyone. It's Charlie. This is going to be my Marvel Infinity Saga rewatch video for Thor. We're going to be breaking down all the Marvel Phase 4 Easter eggs, Avengers Endgame connections that we didn't notice the first time we watched it. So if you're new to the channel, as part of this rewatch, we're actually doing the Infinity Saga box set giveaway for all the movies. All you have to do to enter that is just leave your favorite Thor moment from this movie on the video. Because we'll be talking about stuff going all the way up to Marvel Phase 4, careful for spoilers from all the Marvel movies so far. Speaking of which, this is the weekend that Black Widow was supposed to come out in theaters. Thank you very much, Virus, for delaying all movies. So we'll just number these Easter eggs as we go along, starting at the beginning of the movie, working our way through shot by shot. So Kenneth Branagh obviously was picked as director. He would later return to do that intro scene in Infinity War, the voice on the comms of the Asgardians screaming for help when Thanos was destroying them to take the Space Stone. The reason why Marvel chose Kenneth Branagh to direct the first Thor movie is because they were doing him more in the Shakespearean tone of the classic Thor comics. That's just the way he was written, so they picked a great Shakespearean actor and director. It really wasn't until Taika Waititi creatively rebooted the character in the franchise for Thor Ragnarok that they changed their complete approach to the Thor mythology. Father. Oh shit. The writers actually said there was a lot of big comic book stuff that they had to get rid of when they were making the movie, just for budgetary reasons. Originally, they were going to include Thor's brother, Baldur, from the comics. They were going to do a full-blown version of the Midgard Serpent. And a lot of the big action scenes around the Nine Realms, especially that last big battle with the Destroyer, were going to be way bigger, but were reduced for budgetary reasons. Kevin Feige would later talk about how Marvel played it safe those first couple of movies because so much was on the line. They had leveraged the IP for all their characters, so if their movies didn't make money, they would lose the rights to all the Marvel characters. Kenneth Branagh also revealed there was a big deleted scene in an alternate opening. The movie starts with Jane Foster, Eric Selvig, and Darcy in the New Mexico desert as Thor comes crashing to Earth via the Bifrost after being exiled by Odin and stripped of his power. Or so he thinks. We would later learn about this during Thor Ragnarok. Later they would sort of retcon Thor's power. It doesn't come from the hammer. It comes from you. That's the MCU version of the Thor Force that they're talking about. In the comics, the Thor Force is what you call the Odin Force once he passes it to Thor and Thor becomes the true king of Asgard. They do try to explain the Odin Force a little bit during this movie and during Thor Ragnarok, like they show Odin going into the Odin sleep to regenerate his power. But the Odin Force is actually the combined cosmic life energy of Odin and his two brothers. Remember the scene at the beginning of Thor Ragnarok where Thor is making fun of Surtur? Didn't my father kill you like a thousand years ago or something? The event that he's referencing is actually the creation of the Odin Force in the comics. Odin was battling Surtur with his two brothers, and as they lay dying, he absorbed their life force and their combined cosmic energies formed the Odin Force within him, giving him a crazy power-up. He used that power to defeat Surtur, which is what Thor is referencing here. There was also a deleted scene from Thor Ragnarok in the Infinity Saga box set. I did a video for it, so I'll link it in the description, but Odin passes the Odin Force to Thor. I grant you my power. But originally, Kenneth Branagh said that the opening of the movie was meant to be a look at the Hubble Space Telescope traveling through the Nine Realms, looking at all the different places the Nine Realms, because this was meant to be Marvel's first big cosmic movie. Then we get our big flashback to 965 Tonsberg, Norway, this big battle between Odin and the Frost Giants. It's the same town at the beginning of the Captain America movie where Red Skull found the Tesseract, and it's the same town where Thor would later build New Asgard, where Odin died on the cliffs. You look at the sign here from Avengers Endgame, it literally says, formerly known as Tonsberg. They also use the flashback to show you how Odin lost his eye to the King of the Frost Giants in the battle. In the comics, he actually willingly gave up his eye to gain more cosmic wisdom and power. We talk about Rune King Thor being the most powerful version of Thor. In order to become Rune King Thor in the comics, Thor had to give up both of his eyes, and therefore was able to wield a much more powerful version of the Odin Force than Odin ever had. The MCU version of Thor would later lose his eye in his quest to become king while fighting Hela to keep her from taking Asgard, which is a big callback to this moment. You also notice the timeline. Because it's 965 AD, Thor is already around 500 years old. He's about 1500 years old in present day. Right after this battle is when he would also steal Loki from the Frost Giants. They played a little fast and loose with the timeline and their ages in the movie because they're both portrayed relatively soon after this as young boys, but you could just chalk that up to them jumping forward in time through their lives as they grow up. But because this is happening in 965, it's happening after he imprisoned Hela after they conquered the Nine Realms. As Hela explains it, they were on a mission to conquer the galaxy but stopped at Nine Realms. 
we travel back to Asgard in present day as Odin is getting ready to name Thor the new king because he's getting ready to go into the Odin sleep and Asgard will need a king while he's under. They show you that cool zoom in shot of Asgard as they flip around. It's meant to be a contrast between Loki, the ice mountain underneath Asgard, and Thor on top, the natural born son of Odin. It's also a nice visual metaphor for their relationship, how they're both two sides of one whole. Thor can't be true king or true hero without Loki's help. He's a core part of Thor's character development. We get a really good look inside Odin's treasure vault, which contains a whole bunch of comic book Easter eggs. There's the casket of ancient winters, which he stole from the frost giants, a fake infinity gauntlet, which we've talked about a whole bunch, the tablet of life and time, which can actually extend your life force. The runes on it translate to those who sit above in shadow, which is a reference to all the Marvel comics, sky gods like Odin. There's the cosmic tuning fork, which is capable of summoning monsters, the eternal flame, which we saw during Thor Ragnarok and Surtur's crown, which both grant him power and are all part of the cycle of Ragnarok. There's the warlock's eye, which can control other people's minds, which they would later reference with the mind stone during the first Avengers movie, the destroyer, and then the entrance to the Asgardian catacombs that we saw during Thor Ragnarok, where most Asgardian warriors are entombed after they die. Even though Odin enchants the hammer with a signature worthy enchantment later in the movie, the Marvel designers actually inscribed one on the top of the hammer that you can see here. It reads a little bit differently. It translates to, he who wields this hammer commands the lightning in the storm. It's a reference to the cosmic storm that resides inside the hammer. The hammer itself has a sentience. It's alive. Odin forged it from the essence of a living cosmic storm. That explains how the hammer decides who is worthy and who is not. Now in the MCU, we know that each reforged the hammer, which they later reference, forged inside a dying star, which Odin says we would later visit that place when Thor went to the dwarves to forge Stormbreaker in Infinity War. And while this whole opening scene is all about Thor's coronation in the Frost Giants attack, there was an alternate opening scene here with an adult Loki and Thor just showing off some of their personality. Thor smashes a goblet of mead, yelling for more, just like he smashes the coffee cup later in the movie. Loki would also use his magic to turn wine into snakes, a joke that they would later reference during Thor Ragnarok, when Thor complained about Loki turning things into snakes when they were kids. You notice when Odin calls Thor his firstborn, Frigga gives him a sideways glance because Hela is his firstborn. You see Odin's ravens in the background, Hugin and Munin, thought and memory. In Marvel Comics, they're actually not real ravens. They're just magical beings capable of relaying information to Odin from around the Nine Realms. During Thor The Dark World, they actually brought the ravens back when they became Thor's ravens because in the alternate ending to that movie, he actually takes the throne instead of Loki taking the throne secretly pretending to be Odin. The Frost Giants attack, cutting the coronation short, Loki manipulates events to take the piss out of Thor, goading him to attack the Frost Giants, setting off the whole plot of the movie. We meet Heimdall, Idris Elba for the first time, who gives Loki a bunch of sideways glances when talking about never having let enemies slip past him before. Loki discovers his true past as they attack the Frost Giants just as Odin comes to stop things from escalating to all-out war. The eight-legged horse that he's riding is actually right out of Norse mythology. Once they arrive back, the scene of Odin ripping Thor apart like a piece of trash is probably one of the best scenes that they've ever had together. Too bad we probably won't get to see this version of Odin again. Maybe if they did some crazy flashback version of Odin when he was much, much younger. Odin places the signature enchantment on Mjolnir, casts it down to Earth to wait for Thor if he can prove himself worthy. The town where they wind up in New Mexico after Thor gets shocked, Puente Antigo, translates literally to Antique Bridge, a reference to the Rainbow Bridge. Then they start to use the Jane Foster storyline to try and explain the magic of Thor and Asgard in scientific terms. Magic is just highly advanced science that we haven't learned to describe yet. She describes the Bifrost as a wormhole generator. Eric Selvig later references the Hulk when talking about this in a pioneer that he knew in Gamma Radiation. There was also a deleted scene where it references Hank Pym. Then later in Thor Ragnarok, they called back to this when Hulk makes the same reference talking about the devil's anus. We're going through the big one. The devil's anus? Anus? Wait, wait, wait. Who's anus? He calls it another Einstein-Rosen bridge, but it's a naturally occurring one, whereas the Bifrost generates them artificially. And even though they only use it a couple times during Infinity War and Endgame, Stormbreaker is also capable of opening artificial Bifrost. We get all the funny moments with the townspeople trying to lift Mjolnir. The first person here is a cameo by Thor comic book writer J. Michael Straczynski. 
Thor writer Walt Simonson also has a cameo in an Asgardian scene eating dinner with the Warriors 3, and then obviously we have our big Stan Lee cameo as the guy who tries to use his truck to tow Mjolnir away. There was actually a funny moment where you see his broken truck driving up behind them when they're in the diner scene. They make a reference to Thor's comic book identity, Donald Blake. Remember, Marvel was kind of done with the idea of secret identities, at least until we got to Spider-Man, but they've recently cast his secret identity away too. Thank you very much, Mysterio. There are a couple of Easter eggs around town here. You notice this one reads Journey Into Mystery, which is the comic book where Thor appeared for the first time. Coulson shows up with S.H.I.E.L.D. to confiscate all of Jane Foster's research and Sitwell, Hail Hydra. There was a Marvel one-shot that they did that showed you what happened on the way to Thor's Hammer. It was literally called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to Thor's Hammer. Kevin Feige said they might even bring back the concept of Marvel one-shots for Disney Plus someday. Back on Asgard, Odin falls into the Odin sleep to regenerate his life force, leaving Loki free to claim the throne. Then when we go back to planet Earth and they start doing research on Thor in the library, you notice there's an Easter egg for the Tesseract here where he sees the illustration of Thor and Odin crossing the Bifrost to come to planet Earth holding this cube here. This is depicting the event where Odin brought the Tesseract back to planet Earth to hide it in Tonsberg, where it would then later show up at the beginning of the Captain America movie. Thor learns about where his hammer is and we get our first big Hawkeye MCU appearance when he tries to steal it back unsuccessfully. Thor then explains the Nine Realms in the history of Asgard to Jane Foster. The only place in the Nine Realms so far we haven't been in the MCU is actually Alfheim, the place where the Light Elves live. Maybe they'll reference that somehow during Thor 4 Love and Thunder. Loki puts his plot in motion to get rid of Thor and the Frost Giants by sending the Destroyer to Earth. Coulson makes a very timely Iron Man joke because literally the Destroyer is a walking suit of armor. That guy doesn't tell me anything. Odin actually does grant all the Avengers upgraded Destroyer armor in the comics at one point. Thor then reclaims his hammer, smashes the Destroyer in its head. He went for the head, remember that. Loki winds up killing his biological father, revealing his true goals, saving Odin, then battles Thor who smashes the Bifrost to keep Loki from totally obliterating Svartheim. Loki then lets go as they try to save him, falling into the collapsing Bifrost portal, taking him to parts unknown, which we would later find out actually put him on Thanos' doorstep, who would give him the Mind Stone in exchange for his help in collecting the Space Stone during the first Avengers movie. In the post credit scene, we actually see Nick Fury bring Eric Selvig to Project Pegasus to study the Tesseract. Loki reappears secretly to plot how he's going to take it from them. You look at all those city miles on his face there and you can tell that a lot of time has passed though. He looks way worse off than when he fell into that Bifrost portal. There was also a really big Marvel Phase 4 Easter egg in an alternate ending of the movie. This deleted scene here shows Eric Selvig referencing S.W.O.R.D. And we cross-reference them with the S.W.O.R.D. database. S.W.O.R.D. is the other organization that Nick Fury forms in the comics to protect Earth from threats from outer space. S.H.I.E.L.D. is mostly concerned with threats from planet Earth. S.W.O.R.D. is all about stuff from beyond, cosmic threats. We would later see the S.W.O.R.D. space station in the Spider-Man Far From Home post credit scene, but if you think about the timeline, if S.W.O.R.D. existed this early in Marvel Phase 1, Nick Fury knew about the Skrulls since the 90s. That implies that he had been building this space station long before the events of Marvel Phase 1, even though we didn't see it till after Avengers Endgame. It would also explain why Nick Fury doesn't care that they destroy the Project Pegasus base at the beginning of the Avengers movie, because he already knows that he has a much more advanced orbital space station. I know a lot of you would say, well, if the S.W.O.R.D. space station existed that early in Marvel Phase 1, how come we didn't hear about it till now? Well, remember, we know that the Kree and the Skrulls have cloaking technology, like Marvel's spaceship was literally orbiting around planet Earth throughout the Captain Marvel movie without anybody on Earth knowing about it. So the S.W.O.R.D. space station has probably just been cloaked from everyone's sensors this whole time. The next place we're going to see the S.W.O.R.D. organization featured is during the WandaVision series. If you remember Monica Rambeau, she's a little girl during the events of the Captain Marvel movie. Well, in present day, after Avengers Endgame, when WandaVision takes place, she's an adult working for Nick Fury as part of S.W.O.R.D. But let me know in the comments if you spotted any big Marvel Phase 4 Easter eggs in the movie that I didn't mention in the video. My next big MCU Infinity Saga rewatch video will be for the Captain America movie that should post in the next week. As long as you have alerts enabled for my channel, you should see that video when I post it. Click here for all my Infinity Saga Marvel Phase 4 Easter egg rewatch videos and click here for my brand new Spider-Man 3 Daredevil video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe. I'll see you guys tonight.